Hello again, everybody. This is Mr. Everything, and I'm coming at you with another Wargaming in Miniature video. In this video, we're going to be talking about Black Powder and Hail Caesar, and how they compare to existing games that I play, as well as another one of their game line called Bolt Action. I'm going to make an assumption that you are a miniature wargamer, and you've come to find out what the deal is about Black Powder or Hail Caesar or both. What's up with Warlord Games? What's up with their miniature games? Uh, because you wouldn't have come to this video if you weren't interested in this time period or this era of formation units. Uh, you know, units that are in blocks. Uh, you got multiple figures mounted on the same base, put into different f formations using uh, sword and shield with bows or uh, muskets and cannons. Okay, so. Uh, I assume I'm making an assumption that you're that's what kind of gamer you are now I'm also going to make an assumption that you might have played some other miniature games and you're interested in knowing why these would be the good choice for you well they might or might not be the good choice for you but I'm going to go into that now I'm going to let you know that I've not played either one of these games I've not played either one I have just recently got these a couple of weeks ago got these I've glanced through both of them, reading each of the chapters, not completely thoroughly, okay? I want you to understand that I've glanced through these rules, reading the topics that I wanted to read, and, and, skip, and skimming over the other stuff. So I'm not 100% on either one of these games. So uh, just, just know that. If I get something wrong... I blame you. No, I'm just kidding. I, I if I get something wrong, obviously I, I'm stupid. Okay, or or I just ha I just didn't get to that part of the rules, or I made a mistake. Okay, but uh, so I'm going to talk about these in generalities and not in any specifics. So like I'm not going to go over the rules of each one of these. Some rules, yes, but I'm not going to go over the specific rules in either one of these books. First of all, I don't know them all, and secondly. That's a topic of a boot camp. I have a boot camp out online right now called Bolt Action Boot Camp. It explains every single rule in Bolt Action. You should check that out. It's 12 videos. It's an excellent line. Got lots of raves and reviews about those that, that line. Check it out. I will do a Bolt Action Black Powder, and I will do no Bolt Action, but a, a Black Powder Boot Camp, and I will do a Hail Caesar boot camp as well. Uh, we might call it something else like Hail Caesar, uh, what do they call that, training ground, whatever. But there's a there's a Roman word for it. But either way, I'm going to do one for, but I probably won't because then people won't know what I'm talking about. So I'll probably do a boot camp for each of these as well, uh, just to let everyone know the rules. <clears throat> so think of these as kind of a first impression, comparison, open boxing, whatever you want to call it, okay? All right. So now you're saying, now you're asking yourself, Mr. Everything, why do you have Black Powder and Hail Caesar in front of you? Why aren't you talking about just Black Powder or just Hail Caesar? Well, both of these games are so similar, they are almost exactly the same game that cover, and you can even kind of see based on the way the book the books are laid out. These books are almost exactly the same rules just different time periods. This one covers the no armor or very little armor and bayonets on muskets that you have to ramrod and load and maybe some rifles. Zulus had the, the cartridge rifles and things like that. It's Luana and all that. Um, Forks Drift. But in Hail Caesar, you're talking about all of the armor, sword, shield, bow, spear era. So this has like ballistas and catapults and, and uh, formations of guys in armor with swords and shields. And this has guys with muskets laying down hail, you know, fire you know, from woodline or whatever. That's, that's black powder. So there is a game that goes in between these two eras because that's a big gap between the Middle Ages with uh, Agincourt and all that up to... Uh, the early black powder, even the American War of Independence, uh, American Revolution, Napoleonics. Okay, there's a area era in between there, 
And that game is called Pike and Shot. I'm not interested in Pike and Shot at all. I don't plan to ever buy Pike and Shot, so that's not a that's not an era that I'm interested in. So, but I am interest, very interested in these two eras, so I'm going to talk about these two as one game. This is one game. Now, there are some modifications between the games to, uh, to emphasize strategies and tactics from each of these time periods, but basically, it's the same game mechanics. If you learn how to play Black Powder, in five minutes, you could be playing Hail Caesar and vice versa. If you know how to play Hail Caesar, you also know how to play Black Powder. The die rolling conventions are the same. A lot of the modifiers are the same. Almost everything's the same. There's just some differences. Like, yeah, we'll, we'll get into that. Like movement ranges are, is a big difference, is the biggest difference, and we'll get into that in a moment. Okay, so now when it comes to scale, you can play either one of these games in any scale. So if you've got 15 millimeter miniatures, use them. If you've got 54 millimeter miniatures, use them. If you've got 28 millimeter miniatures, that's what everybody else is playing this game in. That's what Warlord produces for these games. Uh, Victrix, Perry Miniatures, Old Glory, Warlord, Italery, Hat, The Soldier Company. There's a bunch of companies out there making 28 millimeter miniatures uh, in various levels of uh, assembly required. Some don't need any assembly required. You just cut them off the sprue and paint them. Some you need to glue arms on. Some need to, you need to glue heads and arms and weapons and shields. It just depends on what you like to do. Some of them are uh, like if, if you get the ones that you need to glue together, then you can put them in different poses and things like that. So pick and choose how you want to do it. Okay. Let's compare scales. Uh, now, when I'm comparing a scale, I'm not comparing it against each other. Remember, it's pretty much the same game. And it's not, I'm not really talking about the scale of the miniature itself. I'm talking about the scale on the table. I play a game out there called Napoleon's Battles. When was the last time I played? Probably a year ago. But uh, Napoleon's Battles is an awesome game simulating large-scale battles in the Napoleonic period. It's fun. It's got its own set of rules. It's got its own advantages and disadvantages. It doesn't take a huge amount of space to play Waterloo. You can play Waterloo in 15 millimeter on a five by nine. Five foot by nine foot table. That's a ping pong table. I think they did that intentionally. Okay. Most people don't have a ping pong table. Guys, out there, most people don't have that. So you have to play most of your games on a 4x8. And that's if you've got a room big enough to support a 4x8. Not everybody does. Some people have to go to game stores. Like I go to a game store and I play. What kind of tables do they have there? 4x6s. Why? That way they can have multiple tables in their game room. If they had 4x8s, they would have to have less tables, less people playing. They'd rather have 4x6s. Now, of course, I could push a couple of these 4x6s together and get a 6x8. Or I could put three together and get a 6x12. But then I'm taking up three of the tables. At home, I've got a 5x9, but can I really play on I've got a ping I'm on the ping pong table right now. Can I roll this out and play on it? Yes, but it would be tight. You know? I, that's why I got it. Specifically for Napoleon's Battles and any other games like Command Decision or whatever that needed a 5 by 9 Black Powder recommends, at a minimum, like an 8 by or 6 by 12 right? Huge. That's why I said those four, those, those three tables. That's way too much space. Way too much space. Now, when the guys at... Uh, and the guys at um, River Horse put out this book called Rebellion, which is for the American War of Independence, which is one of the eras that I'm going to be playing. They said, that's ridiculous. Play on a 4x8. <laughs> okay, so, okay, having said that, why do you need such a large table? Well, this is the, this is the problem that I have with this game. 
Uh, I don't know. I've not played it, so I don't know exactly the mechanics behind it. But you make a command roll to move. You could technically, if you roll good enough, and it's really not that hard to, to roll good enough because you get these, these easy numbers and you have to beat them. And if you beat them well enough, which is pretty easy, actually, I've noticed, you get three moves. Okay, I'm okay with that. I'm okay with getting zero moves, one move, two moves, or three moves. Okay, that's fine. That's a great mechanic. I love it. And, and, you, and I'll get into the mechanics here in just a second, but you could potentially have three moves is what I'm saying. In this game versus this game, this game gives a six-inch move, and this game gives a 12-inch move. That's with infantry in formation. 12-inch move. 6-inch move. Okay. You take that 12 inches, and you get three of them, you're moving 36 inches with a movement. On a four-foot-wide four, a four wide table, you just went three feet across a four-foot-wide table in one move. And most likely, you didn't start on the edge. Most likely, you started a good six inches in. So now, if, hypothetically, there was no terrain in the way, there was no obstacles to turn, you just did a straight beeline, you would be six inches away from their side of the table in one turn. I'll tell you right now, I do not like that rule. I don't like it. I love the fact that you can get one, two, or three moves. No problem. Love that. 12 inches is too much of a movement. Too much. Okay, let's jump over here to Hail Caesar. Six inches. Six inch move, and I could technically get three moves. So that's only 18 inches. That's only a foot and a half. Much more in line with any game that I've ever played. Okay, I, I think 18 inch movement for infantry on the occasional three move. If I get two moves, I get 12 inches. 12 inches is a reasonable amount of movement. Now, I'm basing this on, let's say, mm, I don't know, Warhammer Fantasy. I'm just using that as an example. Infantry moved six inches in that game, right? Yeah, so, I don't know. So, the, but, this, but you could potentially move three times. So, I don't know. Now, when I was playing my, uh, when I was playing Armadi, how far did I move? This far? Maybe four inches. When I was playing, um... Feel the glory, how far did I move? Maybe this far, like six to nine inches for a turn, right? So I might tweak this down to half moves, like three inches at a time, or, or uh, the, reason why I say, the reason why I say that is if, if I move, let's say it's my turn, and I take my army, and I go, hey, all my guys are in close combat, all in one turn, you know, they just go straight from where they're at to charging into close combat. There's no maneuvering. There's no, you know, let's, let's, I see one of your guys is starting to try to get on my flank. Maybe I need to turn some of my guys to go over there and meet that. Or maybe I need to maneuver around this river or go to this bridge that's on the left side of the table or none of that. When you, when you move too fast, it's, you're in combat the first turn. And there's no reacting, no strategy, no tactics, none of that. So if you slow it down a little bit, and you can, you can uh, say that if, if a turn in this game is 30 minutes, you could say we're only playing 10-minute games. So instead of 6 inches, you only move 2 inches per move. Or, or 12. Instead of 12, you move 4 inches per move. I would be okay with that. You know, it's a 10-minute turn. How many times can you shoot in 10 minutes? You know, like 30 times. So movement has got to be fixed. That's, that's in, in both of these games, I, and that's only because, okay, now if I was playing on a 12-foot table, yeah, you need that movement to get, you know, you're, you've got a ton of movement to run around and do all that stuff. Okay, sure. But if I'm playing on a 4x8 or even a 4x6 table, I can't afford to be moving 36 inches across the table. I just can't do it. 
Okay, so, so I'm going to tweak the movement for my gaming club, and I'm going to let them know, hey, since we're playing a 4x8 table, you know, we're, we're going to have to adjust the movement ranges and the weapon ranges to accommodate like a smaller scale table. So you got to make some adjustments. Bolt Action. Bolt Action is a successful World War II game by the same company, but it is a man-to-man -man game. Okay, these are not man-to-man. -man. So, these actually take up less space than they would if you had a bunch of individual figures out. So, let's take a, let's take a company in black powder. Let's say it's 24 figures. There's not a company in the American War of Independence whatever, that's 24 men. It's usually 100. So you could assume that those 24 figures, 16 figures, 30 figures, whatever you're using, can represent more people, or more men, than the number of figures. Like each figure would represent four guys, or five guys, or whatever. It's, it's, that's not super important, but if I was to take, let's say, 24 figures, and let's say those 24 figures represented 100 guys, if I put 100 bolt action figures on the table, it would take up, you know, 10 by 10 inches. That'd be 100 guys, because they're 20, they're one inch squares. So you got 10 inches by 10 inches. That's 100 guys. In bolt action, in black powder, it doesn't take up that much space. It only takes up a space about six by four, maybe. 4 by 6 area. So, what they're trying to represent is that 4 by 6 area equates to about a 10 by 10 inch area. Okay, so, having said that, you would think that these muskets would shoot about half the distance of a bolt-action M1 Garand. You would think that a brown bess would shoot half the range, maybe even less, of an M1 Garand. Three times this far. In this game, they shoot all the way across the table. It's, it's, yeah, it's, I mean, I, I'm exaggerating, of course, but they shoot much further. Cannons shoot all the way across the table, which they should, I would think, but yeah, it's just too, um, the scale is, the scale ranges are, are, are off. Um, just playing black powder with black powder and not comparing it to any other game or scale, it works great. It's a great system. Uh, it's just that when I use a smaller table, I want to have smaller ranges and I want to have smaller movement ranges. Uh, if I have, if I had a, black powder weapon that shot 24 inches, I'm okay with that. That's the same as a M M1 in, in bolt action. I'm okay with that. If, if, it, if it only shot 12 inches, like in my other game, uh, British Grenadier, it shoots 12 inches. That's even better. That means you have to be pretty much within one movement of your opponent when you shoot at them. And that, to me, represents the risk of getting close to someone, shooting. You know, they, the, the two lines would come together, they would stop, and they would shoot at each other, right? That's pretty much the way Napoleonics, American War of Independence, all of those, French and Indian War, whatever, they would move up, they would fire. And then, if they wanted to, they could reload and shoot again, reload and shoot again, and then wait for somebody to break, or they would charge in and close. You, as a soldier in that era, would not get a bunch of shots in before they closed, because they would just barely be in range when you sh or they would be in range, you would shoot, and then they would make contact before you would have a chance to reload. So, in my games, I'm going to reduce the weapon ranges to equal movement ranges. 
I don't like having the muskets shoot like... Well, in this game right now, they do, because you can shoot like... Thir Let's check. Okay, rifled muskets, 24 inches. Smooth bore muskets, 18 inches. That's okay if you leave movement at 12 inches. That's okay. But if I reduce the movement to 6 inches, then I'm going to have to also have these movements, or these ranges. So if I make the smoothbore musket shoot 9 inches, that would be good. And then rifled muskets could shoot 12 inches. That's more in line with British Grenadier, and I actually like that a lot better. In Hail Caesar, I think they've got it right. Okay, I think they got it right, because you still have the command roll, gives you the potential of one, two, or three moves, uh, but now your moves are only six inches. So you could move up to 18 inches, great. Bows are not, or, you know, because swords, how far do they shoot? You know, bows, uh, let's see, here we go. You have less ranges to deal with. Bows, they shoot 18 inches. That's way too far. That is, okay, so they didn't get movement, they didn't get the ranges right either. Okay, a javelin, six inches. A bow, 18 inches. That would probably be more accurate if movement was like black powder, in my opinion. I think these numbers maybe even need to be halved. Three inches for javelins. Because that's, you take a hundred guys, how far can you throw a javelin? You know, you could throw it pretty far, but... 100 yards, maybe? You know, so how big is an inch? You know? If one figure, if, if uh, 24 figures represent, and plus, I think in this game, 24 figures, they don't represent 100 guys. They represent a lot more than that. Uh, well, maybe not a lot more, but they do represent more, I think. Okay, so let's look here. Infantry, 6 inches. Chariots, 9 inches. Cavalry, 12 inches. So your cavalry could go 36 inches if you get a good roll. I think that's too far. I don't think cavalry, ca they got cavalry being double infantry, which, okay, I'm okay with that, but I don't know. I'm going to have to do some, I'm going to have to do some research on that. Not necessarily research, but tweaking of the rules to see what works for me. But uh, as they're written, I don't like the ranges. I don't like the movement inches and I don't like the range of the weapons that would have to be changed that's the only thing that has to be changed everything else in this game in both of these games I enjoy okay let's let's briefly go over the rules I know uh, this was not really a rules this is not a boot camp but formations right okay there are a number of formations you can be in, like an attack column, a line, a march column. Uh, you can be in a square. Some of these formations are not in every era. So they didn't use attack columns in the American War of Independence. They never did. Not once. March columns? Absolutely. Line? Absolutely. Do they form square? No. So squares should not be in the American War of Independence. This is, this is a, a rule I it had a hard time <clears throat> wrapping my head around, was wheeling, okay? In every other formation game that I've ever played, every other, and not in these games, but in every other formation game, okay, in every other <clears throat> miniatures game that I've ever played, there's wheeling. So, like, let's say I want to go, let's say, okay, Let's say this is an enemy unit, right? This is a block of guys, right? Let's get this out of the way. Let's say I'm here, and this unit is there. Okay. And I want to charge these guys, right, over here. Normally, I would have to measure from this corner around, right? And, it would, and you would have to pivot, like on this point here, and you would, you would wheel like this, right, whoops, and then you would take your straight line and you would measure and you would measure your guys and you would attack, right, okay, that's not the way it is in Black Powder or Hail Caesar, 
Don't do it that way. What you do is you just take your furthest guy and measure it. Right? If this goes straight to that and it's, I don't know, 12, 18 inches, you just go doo -doo 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 -doo, boop, done. Every guy can, and, and that's another thing. Let's say I want to move over here. I just measure one of my guys, the, whoever has to move the furthest. There you go. Yeah, that's backwards, but I'm still moving at full speed. And let's say I want to move sideways. I just measure it and move it. It doesn't matter. They don't, they don't concern themselves with forward, backward, sideways, wheeling. None of that's in the game. None of that. You just measure and move. And if you move three times, you move three times sideways. I don't know if I like that rule. <laughs> I don't. I like the fact that it's simple. It gets the figures moving. But I. And, and I can. I could. I could. I could dig it if it was echeloning forward, like you're moving like this. I'm okay with that. You know. I'm also okay with a little bit of this going on. You know. I'm okay with that as well, as long as it's forward movement. Once you start going sideways and backwards, I don't know, other games have kind of uh, corrupted me and made me think that you shouldn't be able to do that. But how hard is it just to turn the guys around, walk back, and turn around? It, it would be fairly easy at this scale. This is supposed to be a small group of guys and not... Um, it, is a, it is a massive group of guys, like 100 guys. But it's not supposed to be like... Napoleon's battles where you've got regiments working together and battalions working together this is just one little group of guys so that's what they're trying to say they're trying to say this is just a smaller one little group of guys that uh, they work together as a team they're all shoulder to shoulder they're not like operating like this in a stand you know like in Napoleon's battles it represents six bases in a regiment in a in a regiment but they all are base to base even though in reality they're separated and there's cannons in and stuff like that so so it's okay to move sideways and backwards but I don't know if I but I don't know if I dig that rule I I'm gonna have to we're gonna try it a few times and see if it works out pretty cool because most people aren't gonna be moving backwards and you just you can you can, you can wheel and turn and all that stuff with no effort at all, so no movement penalties or anything. If I was to institute a sideways or wheeling in uh, black powder, like if I came up with some kind of way to make that happen, then maybe that 12-inch movement would be okay because then now they're not flying across the table because you've got terrain and stuff that they have to wheel around and get around. But as of right now, you just measure the distance and move. And that's that's a little bit too easy. That's one rule that I couldn't wrap my head around for a while was the wheeling of, of troops. There's no need to wheel. Now, when you change formation, what you do is you're supposed to have a leader figure. Okay, obviously there's a leader right there. But he's supposed to be closer to the center, so technically this unit should be like that okay so the uh you know what the leader stand is that stand doesn't move right the other figures adjust to that stand okay now this is something i don't know if i agree with but they're saying because it's not a big unit it's just a small little unit and they can they can shuffle and adjust easier. You know, you, when you change formation, you pull these guys, you face this guy the way you want to face him. Okay, I want to face him this way. Then you put your guys there. Change formation. So basically, you change formation facing in any direction. So let's say I want to change from the march column into the phalanx, pull the guys off, change this guy's facing, put my guys in phalanx. 
Done. That's a formation change. And I'm okay with that. I, that, that rule I'm okay with. You didn't move anywhere, you just changed formation. And I think changing formation eats up one of your three movements. Okay, um, let's talk about combat a little bit. Combat in both of these games works exactly the same. You have a stat called morale, and you're saying, well, okay, cool, that's morale like for running and stuff, but it's not. It's how much damage you can take. It's weird. Um, you have a... Let's say, it's, it's, but you can think of it as a saving throw if you want, like from Warhammer or from some, some other games there's a saving throw. In uh, Bolt Action, they reverse it. They, it's the exact same role, but they reverse it. You, in, so, like, let's say, I'm going to compare it to Bolt Action. I take a shot at an enemy. I hit them, right? Okay. If I hit them, I roll another die, and based on his morale level, I'll determine as a shooter if I've done any damage. So like if he's a regular troop, I have to roll a four or better. If he's a veteran, I have to roll a five or better. So I roll some more dice, and that's how that's if I kill him or not. Okay. In Black Powder and Caesar, it's done a little bit different. You shoot, you hit. Okay, for every hit you get, or you attack, you melee, you hit, for every hit you get, now the guy that gets hit rolls his dice, and he's trying to roll his... Okay, so I just pulled out Freeman's Farm so I could get the numbers right, but let's say you're firing at Dearborn's Light Infantry and you cause some hits. He's got a morale of four. He rolls a four better to make a save, basically. It's a save. Now, why are you saying a morale? Why is it not called armor or, or just save? Well, what they're trying to imply here is... People are still dying. You're not, you don't save versus death. That's not what you're doing. People are dying, but your unit doesn't take any ill effects from it because they got a good morale. The higher the morale, you can lose a bunch of guys and they can still fight. You know, remember there's hundreds of guys there. You don't actually lose a figure. So a figure doesn't represent one guy. He's right, he might, he alone might represent 20 guys. So that morale is saying, do I lose combat effectiveness? Am I starting to panic? Because I am losing those casualties. Because every hit you can think of, every hit is a bunch of casualties. You just don't get to see them. There's not any figures taken off. Uh, and then based on those hits, you make morales to see if that actually, if that hit actually takes hold. If it takes hold, then you mark the unit with a hit. Okay, you can put a little casualty cap on these guys. You can put a die behind them. They even have casualty figures. You can lay them down. Okay, do I pull a figure off the bases? No. Does the formation change? No. I don't pull guys off like in other games where you have individually mounted miniatures and you pull them off. No, you don't have to do that. You just mark how many morale points they've taken, right? And when they reach a certain morale point, and in this game they call it stamina... And in this game, I think they call it... Nope, they call it stamina as well. Okay, so stamina is how many hits you can take before you have to start making a actual morale check to see if your guys run and split or fall back or do something crazy. Okay, so I like that. I like the fact that you don't ever pull any figures off People are dying, but are they? But is the unit being affected by it? It's kind of, if you think of it, it's kind of like pin in bolt action. Those hits represent casualties, but they're not, they're not really casualties. There are people that have died that have affected, like, oh no, Fritz is dead. You know, it's one of those. It's not, um, it's not a phys physical damage, even though it is. You see, there's guys dying inside the formation, but the unit might not care. Or they might, because they're so fanatical, they might fight on because, you know, just because they lost a few guys doesn't mean they're going to stop fighting. They keep going, right? The good leadership. Um, there is something in the game that I, that I really like. It's called pinning. It's not pin like in bolt action. It's uh, you're pinning a unit. 
Uh, usually, and, and this works with both games, and the ranges are the same to pin in both games. And I think that is not right. I, I think the ranges should either be different or the movement ranges need to be the same. Because the way the game is worded is, if I get within 12 inches of another unit, if another unit is within my front, within 12 inches, that unit is pinned. It can't turn or run or move or whatever. It can only go straight forward. So once you get pinned, you can shoot, of course, and you can go straight forward. I might be getting this wrong, but that's pretty much what it is. So when you move up and you get close enough, this unit starts to say, hey, wait, there's guys like right to our front. And they're getting ready to charge us. Let's shoot them or let's let's charge them or whatever. Let's counter charge. So it's not um, if if uh, if you're far enough away, then, of course, this unit can do whatever it wants to do. But once you get up close enough, you're considered pinned. Okay. In both Black Powder and Hail Caesar, that range is 12 inches. If these guys move 12 inches per move, but these guys only move 6 inches, then their pin shouldn't be 12 inches, I don't think. But I do think that if I decide to half the ranges of everything in Black Powder, which I think I'm going to do, if I make their move 6 inches, and their move is already 6 inches, I think I'm going to also half the pins to everything to 6 inches. So when a so because that's basically saying these guys are all within one move of me, I better prepare for a charge. You know, we can't just be doing our own thing. We can't be turning sideways because they might come in on us or something like that. Yeah, I think that's what I'm going to do is reduce the, reduce the, um, make this game and this game use this game's r ranges. So like, if this is a, if this has cab that moves 12, this will have cab that moves 12. If this has infantry that moves 6, this will have inf infantry that moves 6. Because Hail Caesar can be played on a 4x6 table. Because it, all everything's halved. So I think that's what I'm going to do. Um, okay, so that's the pinning rule. I like that. I like that pinning rule. I, I like the uh, formation changing and the wheeling. Uh, there's no need for it. You don't worry about wheeling. Yeah, ranges are always measured from the front center of the unit. So when you're shooting, you measure from there, and they can shoot anybody that's uh, 45 degree from the front sides. Anybody that's in those ranges, they can shoot at. And you always have to fire on the closest unit. Yeah, both rules have skirmishing rules. Now, in skirmishing rules, you need to have figures mounted individually or in groups of two so that you can spread them out. Now, artillery has three numbers for attacking, and think of those three numbers as, like in bolt action, you got within six inches is considered point blank, then you got half range and full range. Yeah, there's charging, evades, shooting people that are charging you, shaking units, casualties, draws. Okay, so basically I'm not going into all the rules, but uh, think about this. The game's not a point game. It's not... Neither one of these two games is designed to be, I'm going to build a Roman army, you're going to build a Carthaginian army, and then we go at each other. It's not specifically supposed to be like that. They, they do have a section where they talk about points, but it's, it's weird. It's like, you, you build your unit. So, like, let's say you've got infantry. Right, and you want to give them. This is like base infantry. You got like. This is what all and it's thirty six points. That's an infantry unit. Now, do you want to give them? You want to give them some shooting up to. They get, it costs one point for twelve inch, two points for eighteen inch, three points for twenty four inch. What the hell? I, I could just build my own army to be a totally fantasy army, you know. I, I totally designed my, my troops, and then I look at cavalry, and they say, okay, do they have, like, a movement range of 18 or 24, or what's, it's four points per pip of their morale and their stamina? No. Okay, so what that's, what they're trying to say here is 
they built the scenarios. They built an army in the, in the game. They say, okay, this is the Battle of Freeman's Farm. And these are the units in Freeman's Farm. How did we design that? How do we balance that? Well, we use some point, a point system to kind of get an idea of how many point values each of the units would be. That's not me. I'm not a point value guy. I hate point values. I think point values, I'm a scenario guy. If there were supposed to be Dear, Dearborn's Light Infantry at Freeman's Farm, I'm going to put Dearborn's Light Infantry at Freeman's Farm. I don't care what the points are. So the, these games, neither one of these games is really point driven. They are scenario driven. They have a number of books for scenarios and, and campaigns, but I think they also have army lists. So I don't have those army lists. Like I said, I was getting those army lists in because sometimes you, you just have to play a battle with a friend. You don't want to play a scenario. You just want to build an army and go at it. Do they both have a bunch of scenarios in the books? Yes. There, this one has eight scenari or seven scenarios. This one also has seven scenarios. Each scenario in the book represents a different era of the book because, you know, these books cover a, a large time period. American War of Independence, the Peninsula War, uh, I think Crimea, Civil War, Zulu War, the Sudan. And over here you got uh, Egypt and the Hittites, Spartans and the Athenians, Romans and the Britons, Persians and Syria, Huns and Romans later on. Then you got Norse and Anglo-Saxons. Then over here you got Jerusalem against Damascus in the Second Crusade. So yeah, so you've got um, a bunch of scenarios included. These books are well put together. Tons of pictures, tons of charts. Uh, now, if I was to give these books a rating, I'm not going to give them a 10. I give the quality of the books a 10. I do give the quality of the books a 10. I give the rule mechanics an 8, probably, an 8 or a 9. And the only reason why I'm giving them an 8 or a 9 and not a 10 is because of the scale, the ranges, the range, movement ranges and the weapon ranges. That's, that's really the only thing that bugs me about these games is the scale. And that's an easy fix. I can just change it. All right, so now... Look forward in the future. I'm going to do a Black Powder boot camp and a Hail Caesar boot camp. And hopefully I'll go over each of the rules and maybe implement some of my own changes. I'd like to play a game of this. Um, I don't have, I mean, this is the extent of my uh, Macedonian army. Army is <laughs> one unit. I still have some Macedonian figures. I've got Alexander and a general. Uh, I've got some Romans inbound. Uh, and, and so I'll have a unit of Romans and a unit of Macedonians, and that's all I'll have. But uh, those will gradually build up. I'll probably, to be honest with you, probably one unit a month. So I'll have like 12 units at the end of the year, and that's enough to do a battle. So we'll probably, it'll probably be a year before I play some Hail Caesar. Uh, but Black Powder, I already have everything you need for Freeman's Farm. I could actually play tomorrow if we got together and just played a game of Freeman's Farm. I could do that. When I do a battle, I'll make sure I'll let you know about it. And I will be going over the rules in detail in a Hail Caesar boot camp and then also a Black Powder boot camp. Come back and check those out. And then also, believe it or not, I will also do a Black Powder Rebellion review about this book, which is the campaign book for the American War of Independence. It talks about all the differences and all the ways to modify your Black Powder game to mesh better with the Rebellion. And plus, there's a ton of scenarios in here. And this book's actually put... It's a soft cover, but this book's actually put together very well also. Osprey, the publisher, always does a great job. And Warlord Games, they always put a lot of good content in there. So I give this book probably, right now, as, as we sit... Probably a nine. It's an excellent book. But these books I'm only giving maybe a seven or seven plus, maybe an eight. And that's because of the ranges. I think the ranges are effed up. 
All right, guys, thanks for coming out and checking out this video, and I'll catch you next time. All right, guys, I had to splice this in. Uh, right as I was right as I was finishing that video, I ran outside. I heard the postman was here, and guess what? Look what I got. Oh, my gosh, this is the Warlord package, and this is my miniature market package. I just ordered this. I just ordered this, like, Sunday night, and it's Wednesday. That was fast. These guys, I ordered these last week, you know, got this in a week and three days, so 10 days, business days, whatever. Let's go ahead and open this up. You get to get a little bonus open boxing right here. Because we were talking about these, right? Yeah. I notice that Warlord doesn't use really strong boxes. These boxes are... Like, I don't know, sub substandard cardboard, but who cares, right? I'm not buying the box. Okay, I thought I cooked it. There he is. Promotional figure. Lieutenant Spears. Got him. Right now they got a promotion going on that if you order, I don't know, $60, $63, something like that, whatever you order, uh, you get a free Lieutenant Spears. And that works perfect. And then I got a free Roman figure also when you get the... Age of Sigmar, Age of Sigmar, <laughs> Age of Caesar book. <laughs> yeah. What are you getting this? It's kind of a thinner, it's a thinner book, but it's also only 20 bucks. Some units. Some scenarios, scenario two. How many scenarios should you get on this thing? Let's go to the last scenario and see what it's called. Scenario five. So there's five scenarios in there. And then this is the army list, and we were talking about points and how I'm not really a point person. But, but just because I'm not a point person doesn't mean I don't need an army list, because that helps me, first of all, it helps me build. Uh, a figure collection, it also lets me know like what types of units should be in what types of armies. Uh, and just look at the list of all the armies that are in the back right there. All those armies are in this book. Um, from Egypt, Nubians, Sumerians, Babylonians, Arabs, Canaanites. Okay, that's all. Ooh, ah, yuck. Let's get past all that. Let's get to Assyrians, Greeks, Archimedean Persians, Carthaginians, Hoplites, Hoplite Greeks that is, Thracians, Samnites, later Hoplite Greeks, Gauls, Illyrians, I'm jumping, Macedonians, China even, Republican Romans, Parthians, Midians, again, late Macedonians, Seleucids, Han, Han China, what was the other China? Kin China, okay. German, Jewish, Pontic, Dacian, Marians, Imperial. Okay, so they got a lot of army lists. You would think that with that many army lists, there would only be like one or two pages per, and that's what it looks like. Each one gets its own page. Gives the stats of the units and the points per unit. Because remember, it doesn't they don't care how many figures you have. That's irrelevant because you don't take figure casualties. You only take you take morale hits until you break. So 
That's pretty cool. It's mostly just text. Because, and there's some pictures towards the back because they're trying to cram as all these army lists into one book. Okay, that's cool. All right, now this should have maybe a bolt action figure, I think. I think it, I think it, any tank up. But more importantly, I'm playing D&D &D tonight. Seven millimeter bolt action on the tanker. American Airborne. Okay. That's one thing about miniature market, man. They make sure your stuff's taken care of. I strongly recommend. I call it miniature mart, miniature mart, but it's really miniature market. focus will get into that but that's cool man that is cool that is really cool it's a naga yeah and then a puny little rust monster <laughs> all right guys so Thanks for not checking this out, and I'll see you next time.